Just like this ice cream, let's get into the cones. Let's start with your eye and then get rid of most of it. And what we're left with is the retina. Now the retina is what we care about today because it contains the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors being the bits that catch the light and convert it into a signal that's sent down your neurons and to the brain. Great. Now we're caught up with a sixth grade curriculum and I'm gonna put down my ice cream. Now there are many different cells in your retina, but the only ones we care about today are the photoreceptors, the ones that are actually catching the light. Now you probably know these better as rods and cones, which resemble rods and cones about as much as your heart resembles a heart. Despite the shapes taking center stage when it comes to naming these cells, the shapes don't really have a direct influence on what makes the cells behave differently. Functional difference between these cells is actually determined by the opsins. Now the opsins are the molecules that are actually catching or absorbing the photon. Cones have a group of opsins called photopsins, whereas rods have an opsin called rodopsin, which makes a hell of a lot of sense until I tell you that I both misspelled and mispronounced that. It's not rodopsin, it's rhodopsin, named after the Greek word for rose and has nothing to do with rods, which is about the most frustrating thing I've encountered in the last few weeks. Opsins comprise one part protein and one part retinal. The protein is the part that your genes actually encode for, and the retinal is the small molecule in the center that is actually a flavor of vitamin A. So when people tell you that carrots are good for your eyesight, that's because they contain beta carotene, which your body converts into vitamin A and uses as retinal when you have to make more opsins. When the protein and the retinal come together, think of it like a hot dog, only the hot dog bun is a giant loaf of bread, and the retinal is a tiny little cocktail weenie about 150 times smaller. It's like the, like the world's saddest sandwich. <laughs> uh. Now the retinal is called the chromophore. No, no, no relation to my name. Uh, it's called that because it's the molecule of the option that actually absorbs the photon and absorbs the light energy, thereby causing the molecule twist. Ouch. Uh, and in doing so, it sets off the electrochemical chain reaction that eventually reaches your brain. Now, on the other hand, the protein has two very important jobs. First, it takes that twist of the retinal and converts that into a signal that can be interpreted by your brain and your neurons. Second, it takes that retinal and it squeezes it in a very important way. I'm like super covered in breadcrumbs right now. That was like six takes. Now let's rewind for a little bit because not all photons are created equal in the eyes of retinal. There's a certain wavelength of photon that has the highest probability of exciting or twisting that retinal called its center wavelength or its peak sensitivity. You can think of it as the natural frequency of the molecule. Now retinal all by itself has a peak sensitivity of 370 nanometers, but of course by itself it can't transmit a signal anywhere. So it needs that opsin, which also takes that retinal and squeezes it, and that causes its center wavelength to increase to longer wavelengths. Small changes of that protein also have quite a drastic effect on what the center wavelength of the retinal becomes, and that's why we have different classes of opsins. In humans, we have three classes of photopsins, all with different center wavelengths, and therefore we have three classes of cones, because a cone cell can only ever express one class of photopsin. Now the classes of cones and opsins used to be referred to as red, green, and blue, but this quickly runs into trouble. For example, the red opsin actually has a center wavelength at around 560 nanometers, which is a wavelength that's associated with yellow light. So instead of colors, we now refer to the opsins and corresponding cones as L for long, M for medium, and S for short, depending on what wavelength of light they like most relative to a human's visual spectrum. Now let's visualize these three cones on the spectrum. What we have here is one of the two most important graphs in understanding color blindness, and it's called the absorption spectrum. You can see that each of the three cones has a center wavelength at a different wavelength of light, uh, but that's not the only wavelength that it absorbs. Just as you get further away from that center wavelength, the excitability of that cone is decreased. Now light of any wavelength coming into your eye will excite all three of the opsins. However, depending on that wavelength, it will excite them to different degrees. If we have, for example, hashtag 420 nanometers of light, 
that's going to excite your S cone much more than it will excite your L and M cones. And the different degrees of those excitations of the three cones are called your tri-stimulus values. Your tri-stimulus values are essentially the raw signal of your color perception. Now let's take what we've just learned and apply that to classifying all the different types of color blindness. Now, if you know one type of color blindness, I bet it's probably red-green color blindness, which for very important reasons, I'm gonna leave to the very end. An individual with typical forms of all three options is called a trichromat, i.e. three colors. They have trichromacy and can also be called color normal. Color normal people make up 96% of the population, depending on what definitions you're using. On the other hand, if you are missing one of those cones, you are a dichromat, if you're missing two of those cones, you are a monochromat, and if you're missing all of the cones, you are an achromat. Dichromatic individuals who have two cones have a severe form of partial color blindness and affect about 2% of males. Now, they still see color, just less, but I don't want to get into qualitative descriptions of color perception right now. It's, it's kind of out of the scope of this video. While dichromacy might be abnormal in humans, it is actually the form of color vision that almost all mammals have, from cats to dogs to this monstrosity. And depending on which cone is missing, this dictates what flavor of dichromacy you have. Tritinopia is defined as the absence of the S cone, which is actually quite rare when you compare it to protonopia, the absence of the L cone, and deuteronopia, the absence of the M cone, each of which affect about 1% of males. Monochromatic individuals are missing two cones. Their single remaining cone cannot be used alone to determine what wavelength light is, so they see in legitimate grayscale, what you might call complete color blindness. Complete color blindness is not a technical or an official name, but it does get the point across in the same way that complete insanity is clear. Blue cone monochromacy happens when an individual is missing both the L and the M cones, leaving only the S cone active. It is very rare, only affecting about one in 100,000 individuals, but that's still way more common than its cousins, red cone monochromacy and green cone monochromacy, which are so rare, we have no idea how rare they are. An individual missing all three cones is a rod monochromat, or better known as having achromatopsia. The cones aren't missing per se, but important signal pathways from the cones have been broken. Therefore, only the rods work, and they are completely colorblind. However, it would be a bit reductive to say that they see in grayscale as you imagine a black and white movie. Because they only have their rods remaining, and rods are super sensitive because they're meant to see at night, when they use the rods to see at day, they become saturated and their vision is blown out, very much like an overexposed photo. Now, achromats make up about 1 in 30,000 people, and they have a number of additional symptoms on top of just being colorblind. Now, the last form of colorblindness is anomalous trichromacy. And I didn't mention this one at the beginning of the episode because it doesn't really fit into the explanation of missing cones. They are trichromats, so they have all three cones, and their colorblindness is also not that severe, although it is the most common by far type of colorblindness. It is also the most difficult to explain, and I have literally rewritten this section half a dozen times. In fact, the mechanism of anomalous trichromacy wasn't even well understood until the 90s, and this means that it's probably still prominent in most public school textbooks. That incorrect explanation being that anomalous trichromats have all three cones, but one of those cones is somehow malformed, malfunctioning, or lazy, and therefore can't absorb as much. Not the case for protonomaly and deuteronomaly, which are two flavors of anomalous trichromacy, and together make up about three quarters of all colorblind people. Now these conditions arise when the L and the M opsins, which ordinarily are very close to each other on the spectrum, have a mutation that causes one to shift closer to the other, decreasing the distance between them. And topically, you could say, that that lack of social distancing is what causes the disease. Typical trichromats, or color normals, have a spectral distance between their L and M cones of 29 nanometers. Now when one of those cones, one of the opsins, shift a little bit closer to the other, such that the distance is 25 to 28 nanometers, they are still classified as a color normal, even though they technically have a mutation. As the opsins get closer to each other in the spectrum, the anomalous trichromacy goes from being mild to moderate to severe, and by the time they move so close to each other they're overlapping, you essentially have dichromacy. 
Having two cones very close on the spectrum means that when a certain wavelength of light hits those cones, the information that they send back to your brain is almost completely redundant. The biggest gap between the M and the L opsins gives the best color vision, which is a super reductive statement that I'll definitely regret saying later. Regardless, it would definitely be possible for someone to genetically engineer a new M opsin protein such that it shifted to be more directly in the middle between the S and the L cone. And an individual with that genetically modified opsin would have superhuman vision, or at least like abnormal vision. Finally, we have tritonomaly. And if you extrapolate what we learned about protonomaly and deuteronomaly, such that tritonomaly comes about from the S cone shifting closer to the M cone, then you'd be wrong. This is even how most internet resources still explain tritonomaly, but again, it's, it's not true. Of all the known mutations of the S opsin, there is none that cause a shift of that S opsin uh, along the spectrum. Tritonomaly actually comes about from two different mechanisms, either a decrease in the sensitivity of the S opsin, which generally comes from a genetic mutation, or a decrease in the number of S cones in our retina. Now, S cones are already a minority there, so if we lose some of them, it greatly affects our color vision. Now, this is called an acquired color deficiency because it's something that creeps up on people as they age or as a result of side effects from a long list of drugs or for a lot of other environmental or unknown genetic reasons. Both forms result in essentially the same color perception and they can be progressive or degenerative, which means they get worse with time or age, something that's unique to trade anomaly. Now, it's pretty difficult to nail down the frequency of exactly how many trade anomalous people are in the world. That's generally because it's usually mild, it's progressive, it relies on so many unknown environmental factors, as well as the world is just a much more forgiving place to tritans than compared to protans and dutans. And because of that, most colorblind tests of pre-digital age did not actually test for tritans, and so most tritans went completely undiagnosed. So now, the estimates of how many tritanomalous people are in the world ranges anywhere from 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 500. So those are all the types of colorblindness. You're not done! You didn't even mention Daltonism! Yeah, so Daltonism is just another name for color vision deficiency or, or color blindness, named after this guy, John Dalton, who first scientifically described color blindness. And yeah, now I have to mention red-green color blindness. Um, protans and dutans are red-green color blind, whereas tritans are blue-yellow color blind. There is a technical reason for these names relating to the opponent process theory, but as someone with severe red-green color blindness, I see red, I see green, and I can even tell them apart most of the time. It's just a bad identifier, and we try to avoid it as much as possible because it is already hard enough for us to explain CVD to colored normal people without having to first unteach all the poor assumptions that they have because they were exposed to a, a bad name. Oh, I almost forgot. Dear normies, while your color vision can be described as normal or typical, it definitely cannot be described as perfect or ideal. In the animal kingdom, there are tetrachromats that have four cones, such as most reptiles and birds. These animals theoretically have better color vision than you and can definitely see colors that you cannot. In fact, all mammals evolved from a single common ancestor that had four cones, and in that evolutionary process, dropped one, two, or even three of them. So as a dichromat, you could almost say that I'm just a little bit more evolved than you. Sincerely, Protan. So, I hope you have a better understanding of what your cone cells do and how mutations in your options lead to all sorts of congenital color blindness. Next time, we're going to be discussing driving colorblind. This is Chromophobe. Oh no, my ice cream! <laughs>